Hey guys, what's up? My name's Ines. I write kissing books. And today, I'm having a bit of a breakdown. Because not every woman is a heroine. Let me break it down for you. You might remember that I decided to go back to school. I am currently in an MFA program in my second semester, and part of the program is we have to read a lot, and not always books that we choose to read. (laughs) One of the books that my mentor put on my reading list as an example of an early romance novel is Maul Flanders by Daniel Defoe. Then we got into an argument because this book is not a romance. Let me state my case. In Maul Flanders, a book by Daniel Defoe, Defoe aimed to pen a tale of a heroine who faced a life of poverty, perversion, and penitence. The book about a woman who was five times a wife, 12 years a thief, only succeeded in the perversion part. The title character was an unlikable heroine with surprisingly few empathetic qualities. The love story was joyless, and the characters mired in shame and guilt while also obsessed with blame. And Maul did not achieve her creator's goal of penitence. She instead had a negative character arc. In his seminal work, Save the Cat, Blake Snyder shows how empathy can be attained for the protagonist through a good deed like Rescuing a cat from a tree. We've all heard this before if we listen to this podcast. The type of action is less important than the intention behind the activity. Two other ways that I found to demonstrate empathy or saving a proverbial feline is to have a hero or heroine with extraordinary qualities or place an ordinary Jane or John in an extraordinary world. Maul was born an orphan due to the fact that her mother was a convict and sentenced to be transported to the colonies after she gave birth to her child. Modern readers have a fondness for orphans like Annie, Anne of Green Gables, Luke Skywalker, and Harry Potter. Annie saved a dog in the opening scene of her story. And Shirley, who desperately wanted a family, arrived at Green Gables but was the wrong sex, and didn't we all feel sorry for her? Hello, empathy! Luke and Harry both venture to extraordinary worlds where they find that they have superpowers, and who doesn't want to be just like Luke and Harry? For a few pages, I felt sympathy for poor little orphan Maul until she started to use her tears for manipulation. Maul cried to the orphanage matron because she didn't want to do service work, and she got out of it for a while because she cried her pretty tears. She also cried them to the wealthy ladies because she wanted to be a gentlewoman. And eventually the gentlewomen hired her as a lady's maid. For the entire novel, Maul manipulates with abandon. She does not save a single cat. In fact, she abandons each and every one of her natural born children, except the one child who controls her inheritance. Modern romances require certain scenes to facilitate reader satisfaction. Those scenes include a meet cute, an adhesion point, where it's clear that the lovers will have to stay together for the duration of the story. We also have a dark moment where the lovers either break up or there are forces that tear them apart temporarily. And there's also the happily ever after or the happy for now. The most important scene is the final happy one, which ensures the promise of the premise of a romance that promises joy. Reading a romance brings readers joy. It's why romance readers come to the page. Despite Maul's five marriages and her short stints as a mistress, this book was mired in shame and guilt. In her first affair with her employer's son, Blame and guilt are bandied back and forth between these two consenting adults. In Maul's third marriage, which is to her own brother, when the two learn they've misled one another in terms of their fortunes, Maul once again aims to be blameless. This behavior continues with the character who I assumed was the love of her life. But once again, when the truth is about to come out, Maul gives a speech to hold herself blameless in the lies that she's contrived to begin begin with. She says, and I quote, 
I am afraid that you have a very great abuse put upon you and an injury done on you never to be repaired in your marrying me, which, however, as I have had no hand in it, I desire I may be fairly acquitted of it and the blame may lie where it ought to lie and nowhere else, for I wash my hands of every part of it. Yeah, it was a mouthful, guys. The whole book was like that. If you haven't figured out now, I don't recommend this book. The words, though, the words of crime and wicked were used a lot to describe love and sex in this novel. Though a few of the heroes were archetypes enjoyed in today's romances, like the alpha male of the elder brother who seduced a young Maul and the gentleman rake who married her for money, or her own brother <laughs> and her uh, Lancaster husband, who was the love of her life, supposedly, these heroes were cast as poor imitations with no joy, an abundance of guilt and shame, and a continual game of pass the blame, there was very little for a modern romance reader or any woman of any time period to feel good about or swoon over in this book. Modern romance novels, whether they take place in a contemporary big city or a small town, in a carriage or in a spaceship, they all have the same requirement. That requirement is a happy ending. If the lovers do not end up together in the final pages, the readers will not consider their work a romance. The reviews and book club forums will call it a fraud. This happy ending typically ensures a positive character arc where the lovers change for the better. Or in some circumstances, there may be a flat character arc where one or more protagonists does not change. Defoe's title character has a negative character arc. As stated earlier, Maul was a manipulator from birth when her mother pled her belly in the Newgate prison. Pleading a belly means that you get a leniency. Maul, once she came of age, quickly learned to manipulate with tears, then to manipulate with her body. She lied, she cheated, and stole for her own selfish desires. If she had performed any of these dastardly deeds for her children, that would have been understandable, empathetic even. Instead, she abandoned each and every child she birthed. In fact, she forgot about a few of them. The children she had with her fifth husband, uh, who was a financial advisor who basically saved her from ruin, these were born and never mentioned again in the book. <laughs> She even gave up the child of her Lancaster husband, who again is supposed to be the love of her life, but she never told him about the child on the page. Her children aside, Maul was married five times. In three of those marriages, she ran the exact same con, that of being a wealthy woman when she wasn't. When her looks failed her and she became a thief for 12 years, even after she made enough money to stop and have a comfortable life, she wouldn't give it up. She kept fattening her purse until her actions caught up with her and she ended up in jail where she was born in the Newgate prison. For a time, I thought maybe there would be a flat arc for Maul, but no. She reached a new low at the end of her tale. Once in Newgate, there was a brief few pages of repentance. In fact, these few paragraphs earn Maul a reduced sentence. Instead of being put to death, a preacher helps her to gain transportation to the colonies. What does Maul do once she gets to the colonies? She schemes to lie and deceive her nephew son that she had with her own brother <laughs> to give her the inheritance left by her mother. Maul keeps secrets from both her Lancaster husband who it should be noted lived the same life of depravity and deception as she did and met the same fate in the Newgate prison, as well as the son she had with her brother. Instead of coming clean, which might jeopardize her getting her inheritance, Maul chooses to withhold the truth from both of these men until she gets what she wants, which was the money and the land left by her husband and her mother. Her brother. <laughs> Defoe's Maul Flanders was added to my reading list as an example of a classic romance. The love story that lasted was forged by two undeserving, unlikable individuals. There wasn't a single character archetype to identify with, neither with the heroine or any of the multiple heroes. This book lacked joy and 
any tangible lesson to reflect on to live a better life or bring the reader any kind of happiness. Big sigh. Hey, do you love book reviews? Well, I've got happier books to talk about. You can join me and my book bestie, Al Penelope, on our new podcast, Ink and Magic. Over there, we're breaking down Alini Singh's Psy Changeling series, a groundbreaking paranormal romance series. And if you want more in-depth exploration of pacing, try out my Page Turner Pacing course, How to Write a Binge-Worthy Novel in 21 Days at AnnesWrites.com forward slash PTP for Page Turner Pacing. You can also read more breakdowns and chat with other authors on my free Substack at AnnesWrites.Substack.com. In the meantime, you go get them words. I'm going to go read an actual romance novel. <laughs> And I'll see you guys the next time that we break it down. Bye.